and welcome back to the Dreamcast. I am your host, Denise Walsh. I combine science, scripture, and stories that will inspire you to dive deep, break through your own personal glass ceiling, and design a life of your dreams. I believe that we can thrive in all areas of life at the same time. But where do we begin? Personally, financially, spiritually, relationally, and often because we don't know where to focus, we do nothing. At least that's the space I lived in for several years. I know what it feels like to constantly be spinning my wheels. And that's exactly why I created the Dream Life Daily Journal. After working through the Dream Life Action Planner, we need to do something every day so we actually take steps in the direction we desire. Throughout the years, I've developed success habits that have helped me to create a Dream 10 life in all areas by focusing on one area at a time. And I teach you exactly what to do each and every day in the Dream Life Daily Journal. You'll find a gratitude game every day to start the morning off right, a space for prayer, meditation, journaling, a space to write down your clear and intentional dream life goal with affirmations and visualizations connected to that goal. You'll then have a spot to write down your dream life action to-do list so you can be intentionally taking action towards your goal every single day. I know that by completing the Dream Life Daily Journal every day for at least 30 days, you can create momentum. And when you do that, my friends, you can live your dream life too. Check out the dreamlifetoolkit.com or Amazon to get your copy of the Dream Life Daily Journal today. Big, big welcome back to the Dreamcast. In today's interview, our guest is a self-proclaimed left-brained history buff. And after over a decade of working as a computer programmer with her software company, she decided she was ready for a change. She had been speaking at business conferences and events throughout her entire career and got feedback that her presentations were one that people actually loved to listen to. So she took that feedback and decided to not only hone in on her core message, but help other women entrepreneurs do the same. She now helps entrepreneurial and executive women excavate their stories, define their core message, and create a breakthrough brand and signature talk that grows their business and their influence. Whether it's in a boardroom, a keynote speech, or a TED Talk, she helps women entrepreneurs create a presentation that moves the audience. Big Dreamcast welcome to Carol Cox, the founder of Speaking Your Brand. Thank you so much, Denise. I'm glad to be here. I am really excited because you are somebody that I met with back at PodFest earlier this year. You were actually a speaker at the event teaching us how to present our most authentic core message well. So like we move people in the audience. And so I was all ears because of course that is what I want to do as well. And so your speech really connected with me. And I began looking you up. Speakingyourbrand.com is a place full of information. There's a free mini course about how to create compelling presentations. So that way, when we do speak in front of people, whether it's three or 30 or 300 or 3000, we are making that connection. But I know you've been in business for just over three years now, and and you had a lot of experience prior to this new business. So can you first start by telling us a little bit about what you did prior to speaking your brand? Sure. Well, Denise, I have, I find this with a lot of my colleagues and this is both men and women is that we were multidimensional. We have a lot of different facets of ourselves, a lot of different interests, a lot of different skill sets and talents too. And so I'll kind of give you the, the capsule version of my history. So I went to graduate school for history with a focus on women's history and gender history. And so I was going to be a professor. That's what my dream was. So you said gender history? Gender. 
Gender. Okay. I yes, was like, I have two gender. redheads, so that really caught my attention. <laughs> gender. <laughs> that, okay, would be, that would be interesting. <laughs> uh, so I was, I wanted to be a professor. I love reading, writing, research, teaching. So that's what I was going to do. And then, but the market for being a professor was not that great. There's just not that many tenure track positions anymore. I was seeing my classmates a few years older than me getting their PhDs and they just weren't getting jobs. So I said, okay, this is probably not going to be that lucrative in the long run. So at the time, my then boyfriend, now husband was doing computer programming, software development. So he said, Carol, you're not, why don't you help me with my software projects and being the avid learner that I am? I said, sure, why not? Well, I didn't realize I was going to get sucked in. <laughs> so we ended up building a software company. We did projects for large businesses and kind of created political software. We did this for about 10 to 12 years. And then it was about 2012, 2013. And I realized, you know, it was not my original core passion to go into programming and software, even though I was good at it. And I liked the sense of accomplishment. It really wasn't what I originally intended to do. So I decided, okay, I need to make a change. I was tired of looking at code all day. I wanted to do something different. And so I started talking to some friends and they said, well, Carol, you're really great at giving presentations. We always love when you present. And there's so many people who need help with it. Why don't you think about something like that? And I said, okay. So I kind of noodled on this a little while. And then in 2015, literally I was driving and the word speaking your brand entered into my head. And I said, aha, that's it. Okay. Okay. So had you been mulling it over, thinking about it, feeling restless during that time? Or was it really just like a, oh, good idea. Let's do it. I was definitely feeling restless. I was looking for an exit out of the software business and I knew I needed to close that door. So I kind of wrapped up with some clients, you know, kind of fulfilled things that we had to do for them. And then I really just kind of, I ramped down with that. It wasn't a, just like a cold turkey stop. I ramped down probably over a period of a year. And then during that time, I was trying to figure out, well, what did I want to do instead? And then that's where Speaking Your Brand was born in early 2015. Ooh, I, I think it's really important to take notice that you really did take a step back a little bit. Like you slowed down and you asked the question, okay, what do I want and what am I good at? And how can I connect all of these different passions that I have, experience that I have? And it's when we are, you know, we're not, we're not resting around. We're not doing a million things at once. We're a little bit quieter that I feel like our soul can start to speak. And speaking your brand really did just pop into your mind. It did. I mean, I had the I had the concept of what I was going to be doing, but I didn't have the name of the company, that. what it was going to be called. And like literally, it, because they say, and to your point about quieting down, you know, when we're taking a shower, when we're driving, much less when we're actually meditating, is when we are we give our minds the space to really to get creative and to think because we don't have all those other inputs coming in. Yeah, I seriously get the best ideas in the shower. <laughs> Right? That's crazy. <laughs> or right before bed, you know, when you're like starting to, yeah, that's why we always have little notebooks by our bed so we can write it down and not forget. So you started the Speaking Your Brand brand. Tell me a little bit about the creation of this and how you honed in on what your core message was. This is a great question, Denise, because this is something that I get from a lot of the women entrepreneurs that I talk to, especially the ones who are just starting out. And even though what Speaking Your Brand is today is similar to what it was three plus years ago, it has also evolved as I have worked with different people. So I remember the very first thing that I got paid for was I did a workshop for a local organization here in Orlando, Florida, where I live, the Organization for Women Entrepreneurs. And I remember getting that check for that workshop that I did. And that was my very first pay for that specific, for Speaking Your Brand for that company. And so and then I started working one-on-one -on -one with clients to help them create their talks. But because I had done it for myself, like I knew how I created my own presentations, but then I had to figure out how I was going to make it efficient to help someone else create theirs. So it took probably about a year for me to develop the process, the framework that I use now that for, for every client who comes to me, whether they are doing a presentation at a conference, a keynote, even a TED talk, any type of presentation, we now, I now use the same framework for them. Oh, ah, okay. But, and, but you're right. Like you can be an expert in something, but then to teach it, it's a little bit different of a shift because you have to take all the things you feel like are innate and normal. And why doesn't everyone else do this? You just kind of think it's normal and make it teachable. And you did that while you were growing your business. You didn't 
wait to start your business until you had all that figured out. Right. There, there would be, have, I would not have been able to figure it out until I started working with clients. And this is what I tell women who are starting their businesses is they feel like they have to have everything perfect and they have to know everything before they start working with clients or customers or creating their product or service or whatever it happens to be. But you're not going to, you're not going to know what it's supposed to be until clients tell you or until you see, okay, this is working. This is not working. They need more support here. They need to figure this out over here. And if you do it in a vacuum, it's, it's not going to, it's not going to work for the clients and it's ultimately not going to work for you either. Right. Right. You won't really know what your audience needs and what your, your ideal client needs until you start working with your ideal client. And then you can ask them. And then it sounds like you created amazing products to support them. Yes, exactly. Because I started seeing the repetition. So I started seeing, oh, I'm asking the same questions to my clients. When we start working together, we end up kind of creating the same types of things, even though it's all personalized for based on their, their speech, but we're, we're, I'm kind of getting at it in the same way. So that's when I developed the framework, not only so that I could teach it, but then also so that I can train other people to use the framework and then scale the business. Oh, so then it doesn't have to be you. Exactly. Right. Because I, you know, there's only so many hours in the day and there's more people who need help creating their presentations that I physically have time for in my calendar. So I need to train other people to do awesome. it. Oh, I love that. Starting your business with your eyes on scalability, because we can often be the funnel for our own business and, and we cap ourselves sometimes without even realizing it. Yeah. So a lot of the times when I'm working on a presentation with my client is that we're developing their framework at the same time. So their, their, their own framework that they can use in their business for the same reason. So they can use it to train employees, to train their staff people, to train their clients, to whatever it happens to be. Because if, when you have your own framework, you're creating intellectual property for your business, which makes your business that much more valuable as well. Mm. Now, you had experienced success for over a decade in your other companies. And then when you started speaking your brand, was it a, you know, smooth sailing ride like to the top? It, it, so I didn't definitely did not <laughs> replace my my prior income in immediately. It, it, it's very, they say it takes about two years. And that is exactly true. Because it takes two years to kind of get that momentum and traction where enough people know who you are and what you do. And you've worked with enough people that the referrals and word of mouth start going in concentric circles. It's like when you throw a pebble in a pond and you get those circles that kind of go out and out and out. In the very beginning of your business, you're just that tiny little pebble and the circle is very small. So you have to expand, 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 and it just takes time. Like there's no shortcut. There's no, I'm going to run a million dollars in Facebook ads. Well, I don't know, maybe a million dollars would work. But <laughs> there's no, there's no, like I'm going to post on social media three times a day. It just doesn't work that way. You have to get enough clients to know what you do and to start spreading the word on your behalf. And then you're going to start getting that, the feedback loop with the clients and referrals coming back to you. And, the, and it just takes about that two year time window. So I, advise people is don't count on that new business being your sole source of income for that at least that first year probably first two years good advice good advice and i think it's that long-term vision you know you're creating something that needs to create momentum in order for two plus two not to equal four anymore so when you've got your eyes on that long game um, i'm sure there's ups and downs along the way but they don't sting as badly because you know where you're going Right, exactly. Yes. And that's where you, you know, you mentioned earlier about having your core message. And I'm sure a lot of your listeners are familiar with Simon Sinek and his great TED talk about starting with why. And it's that why, that inner motivation as far as why you're doing what you're doing and who you want to help that's going to sustain you when things get rocky. Entrepreneurship is not easy. I like to say it's the best personal development journey that you can possibly go on. So you think you're learning about business, but you really are learning about yourself. Yes, absolutely. I was a psych major and my, I got my master's in psychology and people ask me all the time if I use my degree and I'm like, yes, <laughs> every day on myself. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so share with us a few of the growing pains you experienced within those first two years. I think it's really just the inconsistent client load. So the inconsistent cash flow. I'm still trying to figure out if there's a seasonality to my business. I mean, a lot of businesses do have seasons. And so I, 
I'm trying to see if they're, that the fall tends to be really busy. So the end of summer, I think a lot of conferences go on in the fall. So a lot of people have presentations and keynotes that they're delivering in the fall. So that seems to be a busy time. You would think the beginning of the year would be busy because people are like doing their New Year's resolutions. I want to do more public speaking. But the beginning of the year has not been very busy at least for the, the past couple of years that I have noticed. And so it's, it's really just figuring, balancing that client load and, uh, and the cash flow to, to, to see how is it possible to even it out and what can I do to even it out or do I just have to accept that there is going to be a seasonality? Okay. Because yeah, you're right. You don't know what it is until you know what it is and you've experienced it. And so you have to take an inventory a little bit and, and go from there. Yes, for sure. And then the other, so the other thing is, as far as speaking your brand and starting is that I also have a podcast called Speaking Your Brand. Very, very convenient. And that, I started that in February of 2017. So it's been over a year and a half now. And that I love podcasting. I'm sure, Denise, you can agree with that as well. It's a great way to, to get to know people that you otherwise would have no no way of getting of, of meeting or just meeting virtually. And, but just like business, the podcast is a long game. I like to say it's like a gestation period. The first nine months of a podcast, you wonder, are people listening besides my mom? Like, you know, you see the download numbers, like, okay, see downloads going up, but I don't really hear a lot from listeners, don't really know what's going on. And then, and the, the same thing I heard from other podcasters about that month, nine or 10, it kind of starts taking off and you start not necessarily the download numbers, but you're starting to hear from listeners and you're start and you're hearing from listeners who are total strangers that you've never had any contact with ever before. And you're like, Oh, people are finding me and listening to me. Do you find the same thing, Denise? Oh my gosh. So it's September. I started this in December of last year. My like launch date was January. And so I'm just hitting nine months of consistency. And I can say the exact same thing. My last three episodes had more in one day than some of the other ones had in one week. And you're just like, oh, woohoo. <laughs> yeah, it just starts taking off. It's just a weird thing. I don't know if now like Apple Podcasts knows that you're for real because right. you've been consistent. So they start promoting you more when people are searching or is, is it just that kind of that word of mouth starts going around because you're getting to that, that tipping point of enough listeners where it starts taking off on its own. What I, I love what you said, number one, the networking and really getting to know other people is a great way to, of course, network and get to know other people, but also spread your message about what you're all about. Um, but then getting feedback from people I find is so rewarding because I love being able to record in my pajamas during school time, right? Like that's why I started this. But I also miss the feedback that you get in a live audience where you can look people in the eyes and you can talk and you can share and you hear from them afterwards and things like that. So I love the feedback that we now are getting and it sounds like you're getting as well from the podcast. Definitely. Well, you make a great point, Denise, about the benefits of doing public speaking, of having that face-to-face, in-person interaction. We've gone so heavy on the internet and social media in the past five years, really the past 10 years, that a lot of entrepreneurs have forgotten that they have a local network, that they have a local community. And really going out and meeting people, going to those groups, speaking in front of those groups is the best way to accelerate that no like, and trust factor. You can do it on podcasts, you can do it on videos, but there's, because we are human beings, we're, we're animals really when it comes down to it, and you know this, Denise, from your psychology degree, is that there's something about those like neurochemicals that happen when you're with people in person that's going to, that's going to build that connection and that trust faster than any other online medium. Ooh, it's so true. And then, and people want a place where they can share as well. So if they've been moved by your, your presentation, for them to have a place to process it, to come say thank you, to share with others that they're around their aha moments, that can just solidify any new experience. You know, we can have an aha moment and then forget it when we leave. But when you have a place to talk about it, it really does make it even stronger. So tell me what your core message is today. Oh, you know, it's, you're kind of, it's, just, it's so hard to use my superpower on myself. That's what they say. It's, it's really hard to use your superpower on yourself. So it's always, but it's always an evolution. I would say that really 
what drives me to do Speaking Your Brand and why I focus on women entrepreneurs and, and women professionals and executives is that we need more women in positions of influence and authority and power. And I actually like to kind of put a little qualifier in front of that, socially conscious women. Women who understand that there are that there, the values that we have are important from the family level, community level, business level, all the way through politics, government. I, I do, I'm a political analyst during election seasons here on the TV news. I'm on the Democratic side. And so, but we need more women to literally be at the table, to be at the table in Congress, to be at the table in boardrooms. You know, we look at things like Uber and what goes on with them with the sexual harassment. And if there were more, and not just one woman, there has to be enough women so that they're there to support each other and that their voices can be heard. And so public speaking and visibility is one of the best ways for us as women to develop those leadership skills and confidence and literally to be seen and heard so that we can get to some of those other positions. Mm, I can hear your excitement and passion for that. And, and it sounds like you are creating a path for people to strengthen their own voice. Because I have to imagine people don't come to you who aren't already in business or speaking a bit, but they want a bit more. They want to strengthen themselves and make sure that what they're saying really does impact the other. And you are creating a roadmap, a path for that for that woman, for that entrepreneur to kind of rise up, stand strong in themselves, and then speak their message loud and clear. Exactly. And that's why I actually like the term coach. I know it gets, you know, a lot of people call themselves coaches and it, it's a broad, it's a broad spectrum of things that people do. But if you think about Olympic athletes, by the time they've gotten to the Olympics, they've had coaches since they were at least in high school. If they're that talented to get to the Olympics, they've had coaches along the way. And then what do coaches do? The coaches don't do the work for them. They're not the ones running or swimming or what have you, but they're there to provide the training plan. So to say, okay, here's what you need to do to get to where you want to go. They're there to keep them focused on that vision, that goal that they have to give them that support, whether it's emotional support, as well as logistics support and accountability. Okay. Did you do your, did you do what you needed to do today? That's what great coaches do, whether you're a speaking coach, a business coach, a life coach, an athletic coach. So that's really what I see myself is that, as you said, most of the women who come to me have been in business for at least a couple of years. They have a good idea of who their clients are, what it is that they do and the results they get for them. And they enjoy public speaking. So if you'd hate public speaking, probably not the best thing, to, right? the best thing to come and, and force yourself to do a presentation. If you have to, it's a whole nother story, but... They, they enjoy public speaking and they want to get better at it because they have a vision for where they want to be, whether it's a TED talk, they want to write a book and do a book tour, they want to get on a board, maybe they want to run for office and they know that public speaking is one of the stepping stones to get there. Yeah. And you, you know, you need accountability and you need a place to, to brainstorm. I feel like I develop a lot of speeches in my head. <laughs> and when I finally actually share them with my husband or my sister, sometimes they go, eh, not cool. You know, like let's develop it. And I actually did Toastmasters for a few years because I knew that in order to get better at my craft, I had to do it off the field. They say experts practice off the field, you know, on, um, novices or whatever practice on the field. And you'll do a little bit of both. You get better after through every presentation that you give, but there is an element of taking it seriously, of practicing in front of the mirror, of having a coach, of getting feedback, of brainstorming with someone that will separate you from the pack. Yes, I love that, Denise. And Toastmasters is a great way because you because of the repetition of the regularity of you going often and getting up there and speaking in front of people. The other thing to keep in mind is that is the content itself. So there, there's a way to structure a speech that makes it interesting for the audience. So we could just sit there and just brain dump everything that we know about a topic to an audience, but it's probably not going to be all that interesting, engaging, or useful to the audience because they're not going to know how to follow it or what to do with the information. So as when I mentioned that I have a framework, that's what I do with my clients is that we walk through from beginning to end. And this is, Denise, the presentation you saw at PodFest. This is what I do. And for the listeners, I have the story structure framework that I use for my clients that they can download in a PDF form that they can get for free. And that's going to be at speakingyourbrand.com slash dreamcast. 
So you'll be able to it really it, it prevents the blank page syndrome. So you have to sit down to write a presentation. And you're like, uh, how am I supposed to start this? And what am I supposed to do next? And how am I supposed to end it? So the story structure framework gives you that outline of where to start and then where to go next all the way to the very end. Mm. And, and, you, and again, that's just the path to follow. I love that because we can't do it in a vacuum, like you mentioned. So speakingyourbrand.com slash dreamcast, and you will send us that PDF for free. Absolutely. Yes. Yay! I'm totally getting that um, because we all can get better. And I love that. So just um, a few more questions here. What are some key points that you typically share with your clients? Like what's one really great way to connect with your audience? So the number one tip that I give is that your presentation should be a dialogue with the audience, not a monologue from you. The days where you had someone just lecturing to you for 45 minutes or an hour are pretty much over. Now, if you're, well, I was going to say, if you're Tony Robbins, maybe you can, but actually I'm going to take that back because Tony Robbins makes his presentations incredibly interactive. You're jumping up and down, you're waving your hands, you're dancing. Why is he doing that? Because he needs to keep our bodies and our minds engaged at the front of the room where he's speaking. The same thing with you as a speaker is to pull your audience in ask them questions. If you're in a large group, it's probably difficult to do one-on-one -on -one questions, but you can do show of hands, have people stand up. If it's a smaller group, say under 50 or 60, definitely ask them questions, get them to share. Don't save the Q&A just for the end and then run through all of your content. You need to constantly be testing and polling the audience to figure out, are they getting this? Are they understanding what I'm doing? Look at the body language, refer to people in the audience, and that's going to make it so much more interesting for the people who are sitting there than you just dumping information on them. The, and then uh, along with that, I would say probably you need to share less content than you think. We are so close to our own subject matter that we know so much that it seems very natural for us. But you have to remember for the audience, it's new content. They can only absorb so much. So you probably need less content than more. So not 10 10 different things you're going to teach them, but I try to stick to three. So the, the rule of three. Ooh, that's a good tip. And I think you're right. I often think I need eight hours to go through all my stuff and they only give me seven minutes. <laughs> but when you focus on one thing for seven minutes, it can go deeper and you can create memories because of the emotions that are attached to whatever you're taking people through. And then they can leave with something a bit more tangible rather than like you mentioned, the 45 minute presentation where they're zoned out because it's way over their head. Yes. And I have a couple of episodes on my podcast that talk about why well, I have a lot of episodes on my podcast about how to be a better speaker. But there was one recently, episode number 81 is actually titled Be a Better Speaker. And it's takeaways from presenters that I watch at a conference that I attended back a couple of months ago. So like Pat Flynn was there. So I get feedback on his talk as well as a couple other people who the listeners may know. And then also I'll point you all to episode number 63. It's five mistakes you're making in your presentations that turn off your audiences. So this kind of goes to your question, Denise. So I mentioned, I mentioned one of them about the dialogue, but there's the other ones in there as well. Ooh, awesome. Awesome. And, and you guys, no matter where you are in your business, whether you are starting out or you are a seasoned leader, we are always presenting ourselves. We're always speaking our brand on social media, when we're at parties, when we're interacting at networking groups. And the better you can get at the skill, I think it impacts not just speaking in large groups, right? But it impacts you speaking at a meetup group or really getting to know, like asking questions or even creating content for social media because you're thinking about who your ideal client is. So moving on, I've got one other question about a TED Talk because what would make a TED Talk a little bit different than maybe a presentation? Excellent question, Denise. And there is a big difference between a regular presentation, even a keynote, much less a business presentation and a TED talk. So TED's motto is ideas worth spreading. So what TED wants, and, when the, and this applies to your local TEDx chapter. So cities, a lot of cities have TEDx events that, that you can apply to to speak at. And what they really want is a counterintuitive idea, something that's new, something that's different, a fresh perspective, a different angle of looking at something 
that hasn't been talked about before. So at the TED Talk, you're not there to pitch your business. You're not there to talk about your business. You're really pulling an idea and ideally something that that has some type of connection to you. So you do research in this area and it's not really necessarily just a personal story, although it can, it, the basis of your talk can be formed from a personal story, but it has to be a personal story that's been universalized. So I'll give you an example. One of my clients, Tammy Lally, she did a TEDx talk last summer. So summer of 2017 here in Orlando and it was on money shame. So she's a, she's a financial counselor, but it goes much deeper than that. Well, what started her work, the work that she does now, and what was the basis of her TEDx talk was a very personal situation that happened in her family, very powerful, very tragic. And, but she, but when we worked together, we realized we had to take that very personal story and we had to universalize it out. It couldn't just be 10 minutes of her talking about her story. But we had to also keep that thread because you only have 10 or 12 minutes. It's not a long time. You can't go off on five different tangents. So we had to keep that thread. She did such a phenomenal job that Ted, the, the parent company, Ted, actually just recently selected her talk to be on their homepage, which if you've done a local TEDx talk, there is nothing bigger that you can ask for than to have your talk selected to be on the TED.com homepage. So that was incredible. But she took that idea and she had a different way of looking at something than other people have looked at it before. Mm, and, and that's why you need a coach because you're so, like you mentioned, like in the weeds in your own story that it's sometimes hard to step back and having feedback and a place to brainstorm is so essential. Exactly. And Denise, I, I know you mentioned before we started recording that you have doing a TED talk on your on your bucket list. So I do. definitely start to start researching your local chapters, kind of see when they have events, see when they're going to have their call for speakers. And just the exercise of applying is so good because it really helps you to think about what your idea is, what your message is. Cool. Yeah, it really is. It's been on my dream board since 2015. And sometimes you just have to put it in your calendar. <laughs> it's, like, yes. it's not going to happen on its own. So I have to pick a date, work backwards from there and make it happen. Absolutely. Well, very cool. So thank you so much for your wisdom today. And um, if you're interested in learning more about how to give an effective presentation so your core messages spread well within your community, go to speakingyourbrand.com slash dreamcast and get that free PDF outline download. I think that is going to be such a useful tool for us. And so Carol, I thank you so much for your time and your wisdom. And I can't wait to connect again. My pleasure, Denise. Likewise. Thanks so much for hanging out with us today. I want to hear your aha moment from today's amazing episode. If you could leave a review at whatever podcast player you choose to listen from, Apple Podcast, CastBox, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you're listening from, leave a review and share with us your favorite part of today's episode. Thanks for hanging out. And remember to dream big.